Okay, shalom everyone and welcome to another Thursday night psalm study. We are on Psalm 132. We're looking at part two. So we're looking at the rabbis, seeing what the rabbis are saying in the Reb, um, the Midrash to Helene on Psalm 132. And I titled the title for this study the same as last week. It's the Lord allows a certain amount of ignorance. Okay, so um, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. For this wonderful time that we could be gathered here today, uh, tonight, and, and to study your word, Lord, we ask that you, that you would uh, speak to our hearts. You help us to grow nearer to you, Lord, and uh, help us to apply your word to our lives for your glory. We just give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so part two always follows part one. I don't label part it as part one or part two. I just have the first part, and then the second is uh, titled the Rabbinic Commentary. So that's down. Let me scroll down here. Um, there it is. It's on page 9 of the study, and you can find that on matsadi.com. Okay, so the Rabbinic Commentary, the Midrash on uh, the psalm has three parts, and so um, we'll be looking at part 1, 2, and 3. I outline the Midrashim in a typical fashion. There you can see there on page 9 and page 10. Okay, So Midrash Tehillim 132, part 1, it opens with the Debor Hamatil, the opening phrase, and it says, The Lord has made a faithful oath unto David. He will not turn back from it. Of the fruit of your body will I set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I will teach them, their children will also sit upon your throne forever. And so the rabbis are quoting from Psalm 132, verses 11 through 12. And then the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states, Three things were given conditionally by the Lord. The land of Israel, the temple, and the throne of the house of David. The book of the Torah and the covenant with Aaron, however, were, were given unconditionally. In the Mashal, in the parable, it goes on to explain the homiletic introduction. It says that the rabbis described the land of Israel, the temple, and the throne of David as conditional, whereas the Torah, the priesthood, and the covenant were unconditional. Now, you can see on page 11, the entire Midrash, it, says, so it states the following. Let me read through that. It says, The Lord has made a faithful oath unto David. He will not turn back from it. Of the fruit of your body will I set up your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I will teach them, their children will also sit upon your throne forever. Three things were given conditionally by the Lord, the land of Israel, the temple, and the throne of the house of David. The book of the Torah and the covenant with Aaron, however, were given unconditionally. The proof that the land of Israel was given conditionally, the verse, Take heed to yourselves lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, and the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. And he shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield her fruit, and you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord gives you. Deuteronomy 11. The proof that the temple was given conditionally, the verses, the verses as for this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes, even, or etc., then will I perform my word with you. In that, I will dwell therein among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. But if you do not walk in my statutes, this house which is so high will become a desolate and every one that passes by it will be astonished. And the proof that the throne of the house of David was given conditionally, the verse, the Lord has made a faithful oath unto David of the fruit of your body, will I set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimony, their children also will sit upon your throne forevermore. But if they do not keep my testimony, then I will visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with strokes. And the proof that the book of the Torah was given unconditionally, the verse, the law which Moshe commanded us, is an inheritance of the congregation of Jacob, from Deuteronomy 33. And the proof that the covenant with Aaron was made unconditionally, the verses, and the Lord said unto Aaron, it is a covenant of salt forever. Therefore, the Lord unto you and to your seed with you. And also the verses wherefore said, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace, and he will have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Okay, Numbers 25. 
Okay, so the rabbis describe the giving of the Torah as unconditional on behalf of the people of Israel. And this can be analogized by a mother's unconditional love as being the secret behind the Torah's transmission to God's people. When the Torah was given to the nation of Israel, the Lord God Almighty told Moshe, he said in Exodus 19 verse 3, So shall you say to the house of Jacob and relate to the children of Israel. The Jewish commentators explain that the house of Jacob are the women and the children of Israel are the men. The question arises, how was the Torah given over to the women? And the Midrash explains uh, in Rashi and the Mekilta that the Torah was given first to the women in a gentle voice and then to the men. So when we consider, we think about this, why do you think the Midrash speaks of giving the Torah over to the women first in a gentle voice. Well, what do you think? Well, the reason was because children need love, but the kind of love only a mother can give that is unconditional love. The first person to give children unconditional love is their mother. In the book of Ruth, a traditional a tradition during Shavuot is a time for celebration, celebrating the giving of the Torah to God's people, and in the apostolic writings, the giving of God's Holy Spirit for the purpose of helping us to overcome sin in being successful in obeying his commands. The reason Ruth merited having an entire book in the Bible named after her was due to her being the great-grandmother of King David, but also of the Messiah. Ruth was a righteous woman who knew how to love unconditionally. And as parents, we have many expectations for our children, dreams, worries, etc., and we want only the best for our children. We try to direct and guide their lives for their well-being with the idea of helping to teach them the meaning of life, the reasons to live for the Lord, and how to love one another. And this is illustrated in a powerful way in the transmission of the Torah, when and by whom it was received. The Torah calls us to justice, equality, kindness, and softness towards one another. This gift of the Torah, according to the apostolic writings, leads to royalty and majesty and glory that is given to God's people to bear the testimonies of God. And this is illustrated in the gift to love one, to love others unconditionally, just as Yeshua taught us, our families, our neighbors, and even our enemies. And it is within this context that the rabbis view and understand the Torah as having been given unconditionally because of God's unconditional love for each one of us. Now, Midrash Tehillim 132 part 1 states that the land of Israel was given unconditionally. The, the place that we make our dwelling is based upon our faithfulness to God, his Messiah, and the covenant. And the Midrash speaks of this in the following way. It says, the proof that the land of Israel was given unconditionally the verse, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And the anger of the Lord be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain, and the ground will not yield her fruit, and you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord gives you. The proof that the temple was given unconditionally, uncondition the verse, as for this house which you are building, if you walk, if you will walk in my statutes, then I will perform my word with you in that I will dwell therein among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. But if you do not walk in my statutes, this house which is so high will become desolate and everyone that passes it by will be astonished. And the proof that the throne of the house of David was given conditionally. The verse, the Lord has made a faithful oath unto David of the fruit of your body will I set upon your throne. If your children will keep my covenant and my testimony, their children also will sit upon your throne forevermore. But if they do not keep my testimony, then I will visit their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity with strokes. Okay, so note how the covenant is related in these three cases to the commandments and our hearts if we turn from the Lord our God in heaven to worship other gods. And it is explicitly stated that Solomon turned away from God, as the scriptures say, when he was old in 1 Kings 11 verse 4. Solomon had died around 80 years of age. Solomon's wives played a part in his having fallen away, where his wives had never given up their gods, continually pressured him concerning their religion and how certain forms of worship were required of them. Although Solomon penned Proverbs 27 verse 15 and 16, which says, A constant dripping on a day of steady rain 
and a contentious woman are alike. He who would restrain her restrains the wind and grasps oil with his right hand. He, you know, Solomon, likely became a victim of this dynamic. You know, he married many wives. He, he went against, uh, in doing so, going against God's word. And uh, as a result of this compromise, led him into sin. As we said in part one of this, this study, syncretism played a large part of Solomon's falling away as slowly and relentlessly leading to greater amounts of sin. And no doubt this idolatry became upon him little by little, starting small and increasing over time. This is how sin works in our lives. It may be he first allowed his wives to possess small images. You know, gradually, perhaps the idols became bigger. They eventually required shrines and demanded rites and rituals. Solomon had so many wives. It also may be that he was not able to partake in these rituals himself, but gave his wives an allowance to pay for what they needed in the worship of their gods. However, these events may have taken place. It certainly did not happen all at once. Sin increases through neglect and compromise over time. Solomon's example serves as an introduction instruction from God's for God's people today to not compromise with his ways and to stay away from intermarriage with anyone who is not spiritually like-minded. The result of Solomon's compromise and idolatry was that ultimately Israel was split into two rival kingdoms with the with the uh the northern kingdom falling deep into idolatry and eventually being utterly destroyed this illustrates the relationship between the land the temple and the dynasty which is conditional based upon how one responds to the commands of god the midrash it continues and it says that the torah and the priesthood are unconditional in the falling away and this is in the proof that the book of the torah was given unconditionally the verse, the law which Moshe commanded us is an inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. Deuteronomy 33, verse 4. And the proof that the covenant with Aaron was made unconditionally. The verses, and the Lord said unto Aaron, it is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord unto you and to your seed with you. And also the verses, wherefore said, behold, I give you him my covenant of peace and he will have it in his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. So the Torah was given as an inheritance for the people of God, and similar to the priesthood, to the descendants of Aaron. Citing the passage from Parashat Pinchas, the Lord made a covenant of salt forever with the seed of Aaron. The law of God being given to his people as an inheritance does not follow the standard teaching of the church today, due in large part to replacement theology. And based upon what the Torah states, when we understand and value the glory that awaits us, we are better able to endure whatever comes our way in this life. We can give God praise during trials because we have his guarantee that we will receive all he, that he has promised. Just as Paul wrote in, to the Corinthians saying in 2 Corinthians 4.17, it says, For our light and monetary, or sorry, momentary troubles are are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And David wrote in Psalm 16, he says, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And according to 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, um, this is why we are to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is seen, unseen is eternal. That which is eternal is the Lord God in heaven and his giving of righteousness, holiness, justice, and truth for his people in the commands, which is eternal. We can look forward to the Lord working in our lives by his promises. Ephesians 1.11 states, it says, In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Other passages that mention a believer's inheritance include Colossians 3.24 and Hebrews 9.15. Our inheritance 
is the presence of God going with us each day. This is the sum total of all that the Lord has promised us in salvation. And this is why the Torah speaks of the people being the inheritance of, the, of our Father in heaven. And we are his portion, and he is our heritage if we are willing to live for him. Now, Midrash Tehillim 132 part... Um, Okay, so that that was <laughs> that was the conclusion for part one. Um, I didn't anticipate that. Okay, so um, what what I thought I thought was really interesting about this midrash, that part one and, and midrash to Helium one hundred thirty two, was um, in the the conditional nature that we're we're told of the land of Israel, of uh, the temple, and of um, David's dynasty, right? And that the conditionality of of these things, these uh, promises that God had given to his people, is based upon the people's willingness to live for him, you know, and to obey his word, right? And um, that that speaks to us, I think that speaks to us today, because um, if we are unwilling to live for him, you know, we are unwilling to obey his word, does believing in Yeshua... Um, outweigh that, you know, and uh, I feel that that our faith in Yeshua is uh, works hand in hand with our living for the Lord and our our having a a desire to to serve Him. Okay, so um, and I think that's why um, that's why the the conclusion of this this midrash is that in the in our inheritance is. The presence of God going with us each day. And the, the main point is that if we aren't living our lives for him, you know, if we aren't, we aren't seeking him, then uh, according to his commands, then uh, will he recognize us, right? And if we aren't doing these things, will his presence go with us, right? You know, I think those are, these are all good questions that um, each one of us needs to look at um, in, our, in our own lives. Okay, so uh, that concluded part one of the Midrash. Now, Midrash Tehillim 132, part two, it opens with the Dibor Hamat Hill, and it says that this is my rest forever. And then the homiletic introduction to the Midrash, it states, um, In connection with these words, the rabbis differ in their interpretation of the verse. For you are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God gave you. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. So the rabbis speak of the rest the Lord has promised to his people as it is connected to the inheritance which the Lord gives us. And so while I was reading this, it reminded me of something from the apostolic writings from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 3 through 11. You see on page 13 of the study, it says the following. It says, um, for we who have believed enter that rest, just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he had said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news to preach to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today saying through David after so long a time just as has been said before today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if Joshua had given them rest he would not have spoke of it, spoken of another day after that so there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall though through following the same example of disobedience. Okay, so the author of the book of Hebrews speaks of entering into the rest of the Lord and this rest that the Lord has promised. And then um, he makes reference to this seventh day rest, the Sabbath, and also uh, to, to the conditionality of that in reference to the obedience to the commands. Now, in Hebrews 4, verse 6, it states that the people in the wilderness had the gospel message preached to them, 
but they failed to grasp hold of it due to their disobedience. Okay. And so I, this is the, the, I think, and I, you know, I really do feel this is a very significant observation in the text, you know, reading Hebrews chapter four of uh, mentioning this gospel message that was spoken to the people in the wilderness, you know, and that through their disobedience to the commands, they were unable to grasp hold of it. You know, what, what, what do you think happens today? You know, if, if we have the gospel message of the Messiah spoken to us, but if we are uh, disobedient to his commands, are we really grasping hold of that message? You know, now um, the entire Midrash in Midrash to Halim 132 part two, it, it states the following, and that is on page, uh, page 14. It says the following, this is my rest forever in connection with these words. The rabbis differed in their interpretation of the verse, for you are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God gave you. Rabbi Judah said, the word rest refers to Shiloh, and why is Shiloh termed rest? Because after the conquest of the land, the children of Israel rested at Shiloh. And the word inheritance refers to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is so termed in the verse, my heritage is become unto me as a, as a lion in the forest. And also in the verse, is my heritage unto me as a speckled bird of prey? But Rabbi Simeon said the word rest refers to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is so termed in the verse, this is my rest forever in Psalm 132 verse 14. And also the verse, for the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired for it for his habitation. And why is Jerusalem termed rest? Because the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant was in Jerusalem, and the word inheritance refers to Shiloh, because it is written, And Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land unto the children of Israel, according to their divisions. In the school of Rabbi Ishmael, it was taught that both the one and the other word refer to Shiloh, but according to Rabbi Simeon, son of Yohi, both the one and the other refer to Jerusalem. Okay, so um, that was Midrash to Halim 132, part one. I'm oh, sorry, part two. That was part two. So the rabbis speak of the rest that was intended for Israel is a reference to Shiloh because after the conquest of the promised land, the people rested at Shiloh. The rest that is spoken of here is connected to the inheritance. And this is the meaning of the threat which the psalmist expresses in the terms that they shall not enter into my rest. The biblical texts cited above clearly prove that the settlement in the land of the promised inheritance, you know, Israel, is itself the rest that is spoken of. The book of Hebrews states in chapter f uh, 4, verses 9 through 11, it says, So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his work works as God did from his. Therefore, let us delight to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. So the idea here is that the Lord empowers his people to enter into the rest promised to God's people according to the Torah. And there is a struggle that, wa that wages and is at war in our bodies due to sin. And the Lord gives us his spirit and empowers us to overcome sin. Though we struggle, we can rest in the knowledge that we struggle because we are his children. The concept of entering into God's rest is brought out in the Midrash and is spoken of in Hebrews 3 through 4. And so we ask again, what is this rest that the author of Hebrews is writing about? And how do we enter it? How do we fail to enter it? You know, I think those are good questions. The writer to the Hebrews begins this discussion of God's rest in chapter 3 where he refer, references the Israelites wandering in the desert. In giving them the land of Canaan, God had promised them that he would go before them and defeat all of their enemies in order that they could live securely. And based upon what is written in the Torah, all that was required of God's people was to fully trust in him and his promises. However, they refused to obey him. Instead, they murmured against him, even desiring to turn back to their bondage under the Egyptians. You know, I got multiple reference here, references here. Exodus 16, Numbers 20. 
The particular rest that is being referenced here is to being at peace in the land of Canaan. And the, the psalmist states in Psalm 132 verses 11 through 14, it says, The Lord has sworn to David a truth from which he will not turn by, back. Of the fruit of your body I will set upon your throne. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony which I teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her needy with bread. Okay, so so the Midrash slightly, if you know, we look, we compare the Midrash to the Psalm. The Midrash slightly modifies Psalm 132, verse 14. It says, this is my rest, whereas the Psalm states, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Now in Hebrews 3.11, it states the Israelites who disobeyed him would never enter. They had been disobedient to the commands. The Lord had worked miracles in their midst on a daily basis. Remember that um, they, he had provided manna, and the Lord had warned and entreated them. He had caused his mercies to pass before them and had visited them with judgments in vain. And he now declares that because of all their rebellion, they should be excluded from the promised land. The next generation, however, did place their faith in God, and by following the leadership of Joshua, they, some 40 years later, entered into God's rest, entering into the land of Canaan. The author of Hebrews used the example of Israel in the wilderness, not resting in God's promises, saying, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. That's Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. The promise of God is to be at peace with one another and with the Lord God in heaven. And faith is the key to entering into God's rest. The book of Hebrews speaks of the people in the wilderness having the gospel preached to them just as the Israelites knew the truth about God. But the messages were of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. The kind of faith being spoken of is that of relying upon the Lord, working in our lives to being faithful in the commandments of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, explains the nature of his faith. The kind of faith that the Lord puts in our hearts, the Lord working in our lives, leads to our being able to rest in him. The author of Hebrews states, it says that for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will fall by making by following their example of disobedience. And note that uh, when when the author of Hebrew here, Hebrews here is speaking of entering into that into God's rest and resting from our own work, okay, just as God had rested from His, He's the author of Hebrews is not speaking of the law. He's not speaking of the Torah because when we read the conclusion of this verse, it says that and. There, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. And so the idea is that by disobeying the commands, you know, not obeying God's law, you will not enter into that rest. The law is not what the author of Hebrews is speaking of. And so this idea that the law is passed away that's taught today in churches around the world is just um it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to me and but what this means is that we and what what the hebrews is trying to say is that the, or the author of hebrews is trying to say is that we must submit our lives to the lord and to his will and that call that is a call for us to be humble before god and, and this is within this submiss submissiveness to god that our efforts are to be made being submissive to God's will is not about trusting in ourselves but um being submissive is about fully trusting in the Lord and his promises we enter into God's rest by first understanding our inability to enter God's rest on our own we enter God's rest by our faith in the Messiah and our obedience to to God and his will the commandments the scriptures state, and to whom did God swear that we would enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. That's Hebrews 3, verses 18 and 19. 
Now the Midrash on Tehillim 132 part 2, it concludes, it says, In the school of Rabbi Ishmael, it was taught that both the one and the other word refer to Shiloh, but according to Rabbi Simeon, son of Yochai, both the one and the other refer to Jerusalem. So the Midrash speaks of the inheritance of the people and of God. The Lord chose to play a, a place to establish his name in Shiloh. But as we study the history of Israel, only a few frequented the tabernacle and obeyed God's commands to bring the peace offerings and to obey the Shalosh Regalim, right? Um, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. The Lord empowers us in the Messiah to be at peace with all men and to be at peace with him. With him. And um, remember, uh, also, it's, it's interesting that uh, from last week's study that um, w we asked the question, you know, what was going on in, in Shiloh? You know, what was going on with Eli and his sons? You know, because you look at the, the books of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, and uh, we see the, the lives of Eli, his sons, uh, Saul and David, okay, and um, when when the ark was brought from um, this this place that uh, didn't seem like it was it was at Shiloh, right? It seemed like this was a a pagan temple based upon the, the descriptions, the Hebrew descriptions of of the um, the mezuzot, you know, the doorposts that wouldn't have existed at the tabernacle. Um, you find uh, the ark being captured, it going over to the Philistines, and then it coming back, and it going to one house, going to another house, and then David finally brings it to um, to the the city of David, but not back to Shiloh. You know what was going on at Shiloh? Why didn't it go back to the tabernacle, right? And um, there's just a whole bunch of events that that seem to be really unclear about what's going on in that time period. And then what's really interesting was that. They they didn't celebrate the Passover, they didn't celebrate Shavuot, they didn't celebrate Sukkot. And we learn all of these things by reading through the book of Nehemiah and Ezra, um, that it says that it wasn't from since the time of the judges that the festivals were celebrated. You know, and so what was going on in in um in this time period? You know, why did the Lord allow this to happen? And and so it comes back to the title of this study that uh, the Lord allows a certain amount of ignorance in our lives, you know, and um, I think that the the most important thing is that we are we are we are diligently seeking the Lord to do what is right and to live according to His Word, right? So that concludes part two of the midrash, and then uh, midrash to Halim one hundred and thirty two part three it opens with the Debor Hamat heel, the opening phrase. It says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his habitation. And then the homiletic introduction, it states, Until Jerusalem was chosen, any place in the land of Israel was thought suitable for the sacrifice of burnt offerings. Okay, so um we, we read these the the Debor Hamat heel and the Petitha, the homiletic introduction do, do, does this reasoning give justice to the people of Israel worshiping the Lord in any place they desired, even upon the high places, the former places of worship by the nations to their gods? You know, because the the inner the homiletic introduction it says until Jer Jerusalem was chosen, any place in the land of Israel was thought suitable for the sacrifice of burnt offerings. So was was this really the case, right? Um, so let's let's think about that and let's see see what we can uh, find out. Now the entire midrash on Psalm 132, part three, it is on page uh, 16. It says the following: It says, "For the Lord has chosen Zion; He has desired it for His habitation. Until Jerusalem was chosen, any place in the land of Israel was thought suitable for the sacrifice of burnt offerings." But after Jerusalem was chosen, the sacrifice elsewhere in the land of Israel ceased to be suitable. As it is said, take heed to yourselves that you offer no, not your burnt offerings in every place you, you see, but in the place which the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There will you offer your burnt offerings. Until the eternal habitation was chosen, the whole of Jerusalem was suitable for the divine presence. But after the eternal habitation was chosen... The rest of Jerusalem ceased to be suitable, as it is said, for the Lord has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. 
Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. Until Aaron was chosen, all the children of Israel were thought fit for the priesthood. But after Aaron was chosen, the rest of the children of Israel were no longer thought fit. As it is said, and the Lord said unto Aaron, It is a covenant of salt forever. Before the Lord unto you and to your seed with you. And it is also said, Wherefore said, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. And he will have it and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Until David has, was chosen, all the children of Israel were fit for kingship. After David was chosen, the rest of the children of Israel were no longer for, as it is said, Ought you not to know that the Lord, the God of Israel, gave the kingdom over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons, by a covenant of salt? Until the land of Israel was chosen, all of their lands ceased to be suitable. Okay, So, what we have in the opening of the Midrash is the issue of the people sacrificing in various locations in the land of Israel. Some of the best-known high places are visible today, even today, you know, in our modern times, such as those at Gezer. And it was there that the gods of the nations were worshipped, the gods of wood, stone, and trees. We do not know how many high places existed in Israel. You know, we don't know the actual number of high places, but it is probably safe to assume there was at least one for every nation. In the book of Joshua, we're told in Joshua 12, verses 7 to 24, that there were 31 nations that Israel defeated when they entered into the land. 31. And in Joshua 13, verses 2 through 6, it states that Israel had left five nations in the land. The Philistines, the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Gebelites, and all of Lebanon. So this would make a total of 36 nations where six would have remained. Therefore, the number would possibly be between 6 and 36. So we do not know for sure how many high places existed or where exactly they were located. The high places um, were places of religious worship. Based upon the scriptures, five religious activities occurred at these places. The first were animal sacrifices. Second, sexual sin, you know, such as temple prostitutes. Three, third, the burning of incense. Four, daughters walking through the fire. And five were human sacrifices. And I provide references for that in the study here, if you're interested. The scriptures also tell us there were sacred pillars at the high places, you know, in Second Kings verse 17, or chapter 7, chapter 17. These pillars were handcrafted to represent the male and female deities. They were told, uh, we are told that each high place had priests. The gods that were worshipped at the high places included, included Baal, Asherah, the Asherim, and Topheth. And the gods of the sun, the moon, and the constellations, all and all the host of heaven. These gods at the high places were depicted as carved and molten images. The Midrash states, and it says unto in in Psalm 132, well, it's referring to Psalm 132, verse 13 to 14. It says, until the eternal habitation was chosen, the whole of Jerusalem was suitable for the divine presence. But after the eternal habitation was chosen, the rest of the, of Jerusalem ceased. To be suitable, as it is said, for the Lord has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. So after Jerusalem was chosen, the Midrash states a specific place in Jerusalem was where the people were to worship. They couldn't just uh, sacrifice at every street corner. The Midrash also states that until Aaron was chosen, all the children of Israel were thought to be fit for the priesthood. And after Aaron was chosen, the rest of the children of Israel were no longer thought fit, as it is said, and the Lord said unto Aaron, It is a covenant of salt forever. Before the Lord unto you and to your seed with you, and as it is also said, who wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him a covenant of peace, and he will have it, and his seed after him, even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Okay. So this this makes sense because the Lord tells us in the Torah that through Aaron is the priesthood. The Torah speaks of the habitation of God in the midst of his people. The Torah defines the details of worship, service, and the place in which the Lord establishes his name. And what do we learn about this from the history of Israel and the high places of worship? Well, 
To go up the mountain may have been an attempt to get closer to their gods. And there was a psychological appeal to going up the mountain on high. And this provided the people with a sort of spiritual experience. And we know, based upon the Tanakh, that there was also a sexual experience that was a part of their worship. All of these things together provided the people with a spiritual high. And it's interesting how today many people seek spiritual highs. And note how the first place the Lord chose to place his tabernacle was in the valley of Shiloh and not a high place. The Torah tells us that God's concept of worship is not to seek the spiritual high sexual experiences burning your children or causing your children to pass through the fire. The Lord God of Israel calls us to love him, to love others, to seek him, and to know him by his commandments. What is interesting today is how often Christians go to a seminar or to a camp and then come home with a religious or a spiritual high, but then after two weeks later, it is gone. Now, have you ever wondered why that might be? Well, the answer is that the church today, and this is my opinion, of course, but that the church today spends more time teaching a doctrine as opposed to teaching people how to draw near to the Lord God of Israel in his word and by his commandments. True peace is to have a love for God that captures our entire person, that is manifest in the lives of his people in the commandments. And by our choosing to love, to live for the Lord and to love the Lord, we state to the Lord our love for him as being found in our obedience to his word. This is why we find um, in so many places in the apostolic writings on the importance of the obedience of God's word. This is also why we find in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, where it says that the people who were taught or preached the gospel message were not able to grasp hold of it because of their disobedience. You know, our choosing to live for the Lord by doing so, you know, to live according to his word. We state that our love for him is being found in our obedience to his word. You know, that's um, our love should be greater than for ourselves. And that's why uh, obedience to the Torah, to the commands, is, a, is uh, humbling our lives. You know, beating down our own wills to uh, submit to the will of God. Now, in Midrash Tehillim 132, part 3, it concludes, it says, Until David was chosen, all the children of Israel were fit for kingship. Even David was, or after David was chosen, the rest of the children of Israel were no longer um, fit. For, as it is said, ought you not know that the Lord, the God of Israel, gave the kingdom over, of, over Israel to David forever, even to him and to his sons by the covenant of salt? Unto the land of Israel is chosen, all other lands cease to be suitable. So the words of the Midrash speak of the Lord God having a plan for his people and for the land of Israel. You know, and, and it seems that at if we look at the greater context, it seems that um at first we don't know. You know, they, they didn't know what God's plan was going to be. You know, we, we don't know how it will be worked out in our lives. But as we submit our lives to him and and we obey his word and and we we love one another and we love him and even our enemies this the um his will becomes begins to be uh take form right and and we begin to understand what uh what he has planned for our lives you know just this this seems to be the way the scriptures are laid out you know in my opinion that uh in the beginning we didn't quite understand, but as we read through the narrative throughout the scriptures, it becomes the picture becomes clear, right? And his people, God's people in the land of Israel, were to demonstrate what it means to be the children of God, which incorporated his blessings, and to declare to all the world the Lord God in heaven desires all peoples to come to him. And this coming to the Lord involves turning from the former ways of sin and of living and serving other gods. We are to humble our lives for his service, and to do so is to obey his commandments. And what we read in the apostolic writings is the, the greatness of God's love for us, that he sent his only son to die for us. And by our faith in him, 
He sends his spirit to dwell in us so that we have the power to overcome sin in our lives and to live uh, live for him. You know, how, how glorious is that, right? And so um, that that's to to me that's just awesome. I think you know, and and it is awesome. It's not just a matter of, of thought, but it's a matter of, of practice. Because you know the Lord lives in me. I hope He lives in you too. And um, so this concludes the the Psalm study for today. And let me close in prayer. I'll open the mic um, for uh, any comments. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and the great work that you are doing in our lives. Lord, we believe that you are able to overcome all things from saving us from our enemies to the deliverance from sin, even to work in our hearts to deeply, truly, and honestly seek you all the days of our lives. We recognize the weaknesses in our strength and resolve to serve you and to do what is expected, to be humble and to pray and to remain in your word. Lord, help us to have the strength to stand for truth and life to have the desire to seek you in prayer and in your word, to have faith in Yeshua, your Messiah, and to love our neighbor each day. We thank you, Lord, for your continued faithfulness to your promises and to us. Help us to grow in our faith, to walk in the Spirit, and apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name and give you all the glory and the honor and the praise forever and ever. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.